opposing the enemy. The Lord has dropped six things in my heart that the enemy is either attacking us as a church or us as individuals. Six specific things that I want to talk about that we're going to be walking through as a church. Look, I, I believe, no, let me change that. I know without a shadow of a doubt that the church is under an attack. I know that the world is under an attack. I know that us as individuals are under an attack. But not only are we under an attack, I know that the enemy is very specific and I know that he has a battle plan planned out for your destruction. And he's not only planned it out, but he's carrying it out. And he's carrying it out in a very specific way. But the problem is, is a lot of the church is not aware of the way that he's carrying it out. We're not aware of the fact and I, I hate to be the bearer of bad news because I am going to give you some good news today. But the bad news at the very beginning is this. Everyone is in a war and you're not going to escape it. I don't care how long you've been saved. As long as you're breathing breath, you shall be tempted. You are in a battle. You are in a war. And the enemy is out to take you down. And he's out to steal, kill, and destroy. And he does his job very well. And he knows your hot buttons. He knows how to push your buttons. And he will push your buttons. He not only has a plan for you as an individual, he also has a plan for us as a church. Now look, whether you like it or not, the church that God has planted you in you are associated with that church. And the enemy has a plan for us corporately and as individuals. Look, there is temptation that just goes around because you're human. Everyone faces temptation. So there is common temptation that everybody's going to face. Got it. But then there is individual temptation where the enemy does his homework on you and he knows how to press your individual buttons. You say, does the enemy know me? Oh, yeah, he knows you better than you know yourself. He has done his homework on you. He knows how to push your buttons. He knows how to get your attention. He knows what gets your attention. And he knows how to mess with you. And he will not be laxed in using those tactics. He knows how to get your attention. And he knows how to press your hot buttons. And he also knows how to get inside of a church and mess it up. You say, how can you say that? Well, look, if the enemy in the very presence of God himself caused confusion and was kicked out of heaven, I think he can come inside the church and cause trouble. Oh, someone needs to say amen in this house. The enemy knows his job very well. And he's been doing his job very well. But the Lord has given me six specific things that the enemy is either attacking our church, attacking us as individuals, and we're going to talk about them and combat them. So I'm going to encourage you to come and be a part of these services because I really believe that God is talking to us individually. So look, if today is not exactly your hot button, that's fine because one day it may be or next week will be. Or this could be something that deals with a friend of yours or whatever else. But I'm here to tell you, church, the enemy is not going to back up until you reach glory. It's just the way it is. But the good news is this. Greater is he that is in you than he that's within this world. I am not a doom and gloom person. I have victory in Christ Jesus. And we walk under that victory. Am I here to deny that sin is real? No. But I'm here to proclaim that Jesus is bigger. My Jesus has conquered the grave. And his blood conquers all sin and conquers all things. And his blood can redeem you, can set you free, can make you whole. And if you will turn your life over to him, he can do it for you now. 
He can make you new right now. I want you to turn with me to Psalms 139. This is a very familiar verse of Scripture, and we're going to get into this. I know we can smell the fried chicken back there, but it's all right. Hang with me. Amen, amen. All right. All right, here we go. Oh, Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. Isn't that amazing? You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, O Lord. Now that's scary. You hem me in behind and before. You have laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I flee from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. Hallelujah. <laughs> the night will shine like the day. For the darkness is light to you. I love that song. For you have created my innermost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. You need to hear that today. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days were ordained for me, were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of the sand. When I wake, I am still with you. Someone shout hallelujah. Amen, amen. Amen, amen. What a wonderful God we serve. I remember when Emily was born. If you don't have a child, just use your imagination. But I remember before Emily was born, I would get down and I would talk to my wife's belly because I wasn't going to let her be born without knowing who I was. I wanted her to know me. I wanted her to know my voice. I wanted her to know me because she was going to be a daddy's girl before she was born. She just had me wrapped. And then the day she was born, oh, my word, it was like the best day of my life. It's like I just... How could you love something? How could you just love something that much? I just, just amazing. I just fell magically in love. She hung the moon, still does, but she hung the moon. And I, I remember my wife and I would have these conversations. We would say, I don't know if I could have another child because, don't laugh, but I was scared to death to have another child because I was afraid I couldn't love another one as much as I loved her. I was scared. I said, I don't think I could have another child because there is no way I could love another child as much as I love her. And then what scared me even more, and don't laugh again, I was terrified if we had another girl because I said, you could only have one daddy's girl because there's no possibility I could have two daddy's girls as much as I love this one. I was right. I was gone. Just gone. And then she got pregnant with our son. And instantly, it was like amazing. It was like I couldn't believe it. I was like gone again. I just like fell in love with, and he wasn't even here yet. She was just like pregnant, and I was already in love with this thing, this baby. It was like amazing. And then 
and then he was born, it was like, I honestly could love both of them the same. It was, it was like incredible. I, I kid you not, it was like two different faces of Jesus to me. They both represented two different faces of Jesus. It was incredible. But then, you know, a lot of you know the story. When Ethan went home to live with Jesus when he, when he passed away, we had quite a few people come up to us, and, and they, they made this, this comment to me. And, and this, if you've made this comment, this isn't to, to shame you or anything. But they made this comment. I'd have people come up, and they would say, well, at least you still have one child. Well, at least, you, you know, at least you, you, you still have one child. And, and I, I would just think, you know, I could have 12 million children, and it wouldn't matter. The hole that Ethan left would still be there because each child is a different representation of the face of Jesus to me. Each child is a different image of God. Not only that, each child represents something different to me. I love each child, not only the same, but differently. You know, but but through this all, God began to teach me something, and he taught me a very valuable lesson, and I want to share that lesson with you. This is what God taught me. He says, you know, look, not only is my children individual to me, but I was individual to him. I wasn't just a number to Jesus. I wasn't just a member of the church. I was a son of God. I wasn't just a part of the body, but I was a reason that he came and he died and he loved me. He not only loved me individually, but he loved me personally. And it did not matter how many people came to the cross... It did not matter how many people got saved. It didn't matter how many people in the world were believers. There was still an individual place reserved and saved just for me. And he still had my hairs numbered. He still loved me individually. It didn't matter if there was 12 million believers. It did not matter. I still was a person to Jesus. I was not a number. Because there are a lot of times that we begin to believe. And one of the biggest tricks of the enemy is this. He likes to take us and he likes to take away our destiny. And he likes to take away our identity because he likes to make us a part of the crowd instead of a part of the family. He wants to steal your destiny. He wants to tell you. He wants to steal your identity. He wants to give you a new identity. He wants you to identify with something else. He wants you to identify with some kind of sin or some kind of problem. He wants you to identify with something else. He doesn't want you to understand that, no, you're no longer that. You're a believer. You're new. Not that that has gone away or not that you have completely done away with sin because we're all sinners. But no, that doesn't have to be your name any longer. But on top of that, he likes to steal your identity because he likes to tell you, wait a minute. Jesus loves everybody else but you. Jesus hears everybody else's prayers but yours. Now, look, you can be holier than thou all you want to, but I know you've all felt that way. He likes to steal our identity. He likes to make us part of the crowd instead of part of the family. He doesn't want us. He wants us to know. We all say, oh, Jesus loves everybody. You know why we love Jesus loves everybody? Because the way that Jesus loves everybody is not personal. If Jesus loves everybody, that's great, but that doesn't mean he does love me. Oh, Jesus loves everybody. But we forget, no, no, no. Jesus doesn't love everybody. Jesus loves me. 
I'm not a number. I have an identity. I'm a child of God. And the enemy wants to steal my identity. He wants to make me on the outskirts. He wants to push me to the place that I don't stand with God. He wants me to feel like I don't have a place. He wants me to feel like I'm always part of the crowd instead of one of the in group. You know, there, there's the clique and not me. There's the good group and not me. I'm never good enough. They're only more popular than I am. They're always better than I am. They're prettier than I am. They're always, they're always, they're always, they're always. I'm always the outsider no matter what group it is. They're either holier than I am, they're smarter than I am, they're more biblically knowledge than I am. No matter what group it is, I'm always the outsider. Why is that? Because there's a real enemy that has a wedge in our mind, and he wants to take away your identity. Why? Because if he can take away your identity, he can steal your future. He can steal your destiny, because you'll never see yourself the way God does, nor will you see yourself the way that you should see yourself, or will you see yourself or see anyone else the way that God sees them? Everybody else will be sinners and bad people and this and that, and we'll be. The enemy wants to isolate us. I never fit in. I'm the old person. I'm the poor person. I don't look as good. I'm too fat. I'm too this. I'm too that. I have a mole. I don't have a mole. I, I, it doesn't matter. The enemy has your number. And he's constantly tapping you on the shoulder, whispering in your ear what your number is. And he wants to make you have a number. And if you don't have a number, he's ready to hand one out to you. My husband has a problem. I don't have the perfect marriage. I don't have the perfect children. My children act up. My children do this. My children do that. I don't dress as well. I don't have enough money to dress better. I don't have, I don't have, I don't have. I do, I do, I don't, I don't. Uh, you got the number. And we wear it, and we carry it, and we live it, and we hold it. And what it does is it always keeps us on the outskirts, and we never press in. Because we're always looking in from the outside. We never see what God has for us because we're never good enough quite right. We never see our real identity. We never really see God's love. We never really get there. We hold on and we, and we just, you know, we do this church thing. We see God's love, but, but we kind of see it as this overwhelming, arching love. But we never personalize it and say, you know, no, 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 wait a minute. God loves me. Yeah, I know God loves you. God loves me. I'm not a number. I, I, I'm not. I'm a different face of Jesus. And no matter how many people come to the cross, there will always be a place for me. And no matter how many people are praying, God still hears me. No matter how many, God has my hairs counted. No matter how many, God still has a place for me. God not just knows me, but he knows me personally. He knows me by name. You see, the enemy also does this with the lost. It makes it a nameless mass. You know, you know why? Because I can't win the lost. It's too big. It's out there. Oh, wow. Let's win the lost. Who can win the lost? No one can win the lost. It's unwinnable. I can't win the lost. You can't win the lost. No one can win the lost. Who can win the lost? No one. So we go around saying, oh, uh, you know, who, who, who can win the lost? Who can try? We just, oh, it's the lost, the lost. No. The, the, that's what the enemy wants to do. He wants to make it a number, the, the, the lost. But I can't win the lost, but I can win my neighbor. I can talk to my daughter or my son. Oh, my grandchild. You see, if I put a name to the lost, it's no longer a nameless mass. 
it's an individual soul going to hell, and now I care. Now it means something. Now, now as a church, I have to do something about it because it's not the loss that's insurmountable that I can't do anything about. No, it's my mom. It's my daughter. It's my son. It's my brother. And I have to care. It's no longer some nameless mass that doesn't matter. But it's my heart. It's my husband. It's my wife. It may be me. He wants to make us a number. But we're not. God said, I know your inner being. I, I know you. I know who you are. I know every part about you. I knit you together in your mother's womb. I know you better than you know yourself. I spoke you into existence. Don't tell me who you are. Because I made you. I will tell you who you are. I dream the dream over you. I have a destiny for you. If you will stop listening to the enemy giving you a number and start listening to me giving you my dream. I have a destiny for you. I want to look at a couple of these things. I want to break it down real fast. Real fast. If you're taking notes, number one, I want you to write this down. Only one. Only one. I want you to write this down. So I want you to hear me. Only one. Before you get mad, I want you to hear every word I say. I want to share my heart with you for one minute. I think... Now listen, I, I, I understand why we do this, and I understand the reasons, and I'm not debating that. I just want you to hear my heart for one minute. I think we depersonalize the cross when we say Jesus died for everyone. Listen to me. I do not believe Jesus died for everyone. I do not believe Jesus died for everyone. Jesus died for me. When Jesus was hanging on the cross, he did not die for some nameless mass, some group of people, or somebody that would be one day. You were on his mind. He knew you by name. He knew you individually. And he died for you. The Bible says that if you were the only one here on planet earth, he still would have came and died. Jesus didn't die for some group of people. He didn't even die for the church. He died for the members. He didn't die for the world. He didn't die for some nameless mass. He didn't die for somebody that one day would be. He didn't die for the, he didn't die for people that we could say. He didn't die for everybody. When he hung on the cross, your name was on his mind. He knew who you were, and he knew your face, and he died for you. He took the breath. He took the nails. He took it all with you on his mind. We say, oh, no, 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 he died for every." No, he did not. My name was on his mind. Your name was on his mind. He didn't die for some people that one day would exist that he didn't know about. He didn't die for somebody that one day would exist that would one day cry out to him. It wasn't for some theoretical individual or some theoretical people or some theoretical person or some church one day. 
It wasn't for somebody that might one day get saved or someday look right or someday be right or someday do it all together. No, when he hung on the cross, forced was on his mind, period. And so was I, so was you and everyone else. He called you by name and he took your sin, your pain, your punishment, and he took your sickness and he died for you. You are not a number. You are an individual to God. He sees you. He knows you. He hears you. He loves you. He died for you. He's calling you. He dreams over you. It's not depersonalized. It's not theoretical. It's not something that we think about one day. It's not something that one day we'll get around to. No, when he hung on the cross, it was real. It was personal. He took it for you. It was real. And if you were the only one that existed, he still would have done the same thing. It was real. It wasn't theoretical. It wasn't for buildings or stars or mountains. It wasn't for someone better. No, it was for you. It doesn't matter about your pocketbook. It doesn't matter about what number the enemy has given you. If you were the only one that existed, he would have done the same thing. It's all about you. It was individualized. It was personalized. It was not about anyone else but you. And then the next person, and then the next person, because he loved us all. He knit us together in our mother's womb. Number two, he knows your possibilities. He knows what you're made of. I love this. 15 says this, my frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. Oh, the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Before one of them came to be. Look, he knows what you can become. He knows what you can accomplish. He knows what you can handle because he's already dreamed over you. He knows your possibilities. The best thing you can ever do is turn your life over to God because he's already dreamed over you. The Bible says not to lean on your own understanding, but in all your ways. All your ways. Trust in God. Look, family doesn't always understand what God has dreamed over you. Friends don't always understand. But God has a dream for you. And God is the fulfiller of those dreams. I love what Jeremiah says. He says, for I know the plans I have for you. You see, he not only has plans, but he knows those plans because he knows those possibilities. Listen to me. You're not a random accident or an assembly line part. You were created by the master designer. Jesus chiseled you, and he gave a plan for your life. He knit you together in your mother's womb, and he wrote all your days down in his book. You're not an assembly line product. Let me say that again. I don't think anybody in this room is hearing me. I said, you're not an assembly line product. You were created by the master designer. He knit you together. He cut you out. He knows your possibilities. He dreamed over you. He knows the plans he has for you. And the same God that has plans for you is the same God that's going to bring it to pass. If he's put a dream in your heart, he will bring it to pass. He will bring it. He will work it out. He knows your possibilities. And listen to me. There is no demon in hell that can stop God's plan for your life if you are submitted to him. Because he has written down and ordained your life before you were even born. 
And they were written in his books before the foundation of the world. And they will not be changed. You are created and chiseled by God himself. You're not an assembly line product that is just floating through the earth. And he's just, which brings us to the next one. I love this. God knows your limitations. And all of us are different. And all of us have different load levels. But he knows what you can't and cannot handle. Look, you know why this is great? You see, you're not just, a, you're not a number to God. Which means this, God doesn't have to try to like figure you out. And he doesn't have to like try to like figure out what you can handle. He already knows you. He created you. He knows what you can handle. He knows what you can go through. He knows what you're able to take care of. He knows your load limit. He knows your limitations. He knows you. You can trust him. He gives us a great promise. He says, I will never put more on you than you can handle. But the, the connotation of that doesn't mean that you can't take more upon yourself than you can handle. Sometimes we get ourselves into a jackpot because we don't always trust in all of his ways. You see, you and I can hinder his plan for our life because you and I can do things that we can mess up. We can trust not. But here's the deal. God knows your limitations. If you are serving him and you are surrendered unto him, God knows what you can handle and God can take care of it. He will take care of it. He doesn't have to do work. He doesn't have to figure it out. He doesn't have to come down doing an experiment to see if you can handle it. He already knows. That's exciting. I can rest. God knows my possibilities. God knows my limitations. God knows. God knows me better than I know myself. And God also knows my need. God knows my need. You know, not all of us know exactly what we have need of, but God does. Listen, our faith is not in what we understand Our faith is what our God knows. It's true. Our faith is not in what we understand, but our faith is in what God knows. God knows what I have need of. God knows. He knows your need. He knows your possibilities. He knows your limitations, and he knows your need. Even before you ask it, he knows. You're not a number. He knows you. He loves you. He died for you. You are an individual unto God. You are not a number. He knows what you can handle. When he hung on the cross, he was calling your name. Look, if you have a need this morning, God knows. If you're going through something this morning, God knows. If you're about to the edge of your limit, God knows. You can either surrender this morning and let him take care of it. Or you can handle it yourself. And you know where that goes. It's time that we get real. The one that knit us together and woven us together in the and our mother's womb is crying out for us. The same God. You, you know what's amazing? And, I, and I, I told you this when we tried out. We see God's love when he nailed himself to the cross. But we sometimes forget his love when he came off. But the same Jesus that loved us so much to die on the cross is the same Jesus that loves us now. So if the worship team will come back up, we're, we're going to do two special things today. So please, please don't leave unless you absolutely have to. The first, I, I just have to ask, 
And then the second one is for all of us. We're going to, do, we're going to symbolize this. If the worship team will just hold off for just a second. I'm going to ask everybody, what we're going to do is we're going to bring the cross out here. And I have a sheets of paper over here with pens and a, we're got a stapler. And I'm going to ask you, 